It's chapter 8. This is now going to be the third sermon in this series on prayer. And as we're looking at it, I want us to look at Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, and the first verse, chapter 8, as a context of everything that I'm going to say in the next few minutes. Amen? And I assure you, you will get out of here. I will not keep you till 2 o'clock. There is therefore, uh, let me back up. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now we have talked and mentioned last week our Bill of Rights in Christ Jesus. Today we're going to look at three more aspects of our Bill of Rights. And we all know what the Bill of Rights is supposed to be, don't we? Amen? I'm afraid that too often people are trying to change that for Americans. But I want to tell you, you can't change the Bill of Rights that Jesus gave us. Amen? Amen. There's no government or legislature that can change the ones that Jesus gave us. We stated the other week that we were free from sin and its penalties. That we're free from death to enjoy eternal life. And that we are free to serve and worship God. Thank God. The sermon this morning is entitled, Let Freedom Reign. Let Freedom Reign. For he that the Son set free, <laughs> amen, is free indeed. Amen. Not just free, but free indeed. Amen. In other words, Jesus punctuated that. Amen. You don't have to worry about your freedom. You don't have to worry about being free. Jesus is saying, when I said it is finished on the cross, I meant your freedom was purchased on the cross and it is free indeed. Amen? Amen. In the passage before us, we see Paul's struggle in the flesh. But we also see he finds his victory in Christ Jesus over the struggle. In fact, Paul was having the same struggle that every man and woman born of woman has. It's called the old Adamic nature. The wrestle of the flesh, our flesh, against the Spirit of God and against the Spirit that God has born again in you. There's a struggle there. We're going to look at it just a little closer. In Romans chapter 6, Paul speaks concerning the born again experience that begins our freedom from sin and the wrath of God. When you read Romans chapter 6, keep in mind this chapter is talking about the born again experience. Now, it might help us to know Paul never went to the church in Rome. He wanted to. He did not plant this church. But he was writing to a Gentile church. Primarily Gentiles. Us. And he was writing to a new or young congregation and he wanted to establish them in Christ Jesus. You see, they weren't raised up at a Jewish table. They weren't raised up by a daddy that followed what God said in the law and taught them what their sacrifices were and what their feasts were and what it was all about in Judaism. They didn't have that background. They worshipped idols. They worshipped emperors. They worshipped everything that they called God but the real God. Amen? And so Paul is writing to a people who need a foundational faith in order for it to be built on. Remember, faith builds on faith. We go from faith to faith, from the earthly to the heavenly, and from glory to glory. So when it talks about mustard seed faith, we all begin there because we receive to get the faith. 
But he also says there's a time if you continue to grow in faith, you can get to great faith. So faith is a growing thing or should be a growing thing. In other words, every year you walk with God, you should be able to believe Him for something bigger and greater and more awesome if it could be more awesome. Amen? Amen. I do submit to you, you can't get more awesome than the salvation of mankind. Amen. Saving a man from the pits of hell. That's pretty awesome to me. Amen? Now, when we look at this, in Romans chapter 7, Paul speaks concerning the process of sanctification and its power to set men free from the power of sin and to bring under the dominion of their flesh. The born experience, again experience, sets men free from their sin historically. Okay? It's blotted out from you. The blood of Jesus washes you white as snow in the born again experience. But then there's that struggle that we talked about. That struggle between the flesh and the spirit because your spirit was dead in trespasses and sin until you heard the word of faith you accepted Jesus Christ and everything He did at Calvary. Jesus Christ's Spirit came to dwell inside of you because if you have not the Spirit of Him, of Christ, you have none of His. So the Spirit of Christ is indwelling you at the born again experience. And yet there's still a problem. Our flesh likes to rule. Our flesh likes to lead us and too often time our flesh leads us into trouble. Amen? Read Galatians chapter 6 in particular parts when it talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, Because it's the works of the flesh, Paul says, we're supposed to put off. And that word put off means like taking your dirty clothes off. Okay, Then he says you're supposed to put on Christ and all the things concerning the fruit of the Spirit. That means like putting on, getting dressed. Amen? So, God says, I have let Jesus come. He's lived and showed you the way. He was the example. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled all righteousness. Now, you have someone to model your life after. Amen? Now, folks, I'll be honest with you. I've met some pretty precious dear sisters in the Lord and some pretty precious dear brothers in the Lord. I've seen some pretty awesome ministers in the Lord. But I don't model my life after any of them. Amen? Because they are human. They are imperfect. They are subject to fail. And see, by me modeling myself after the Jesus of the Bible, guess what? I'm guaranteed I'll never fail. Amen? Because Jesus never failed. No matter what it came against Him, Jesus overcame it. And because He overcame it, we can overcome Him by faith in Him. Amen? So, when we start this thing, we got to realize we are not losers. We're winners. And Jesus is teaching us as our coach how to win every time in a spiritual battle if we will listen to Him and follow His Word. Now, it is chapter 7... That's sanctification. Sanctification deals with the power of sin. It's that which separates us as a holy vessel to worship God. It is something that the Spirit does, but it's something that we do in the Word. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Paul said, it had it not been for the law, the commandments of God, I would not have known sin. Okay? So it is the Word of God that is our standard. Now listen to me. Our standard is not somebody's personal convictions. Understand the qualification. Personal means it's their convictions. Okay? Every one of us should have personal convictions. Mm -hmm. What we believe with all our heart, what we believe that the Bible truly teaches. But because we are different people, we don't understand it always the same way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And as a result, 
we understand and sometimes interpret the Word of God, shouldn't, but we do, from our experience, rather than allowing the Word of God to interpret our experience. Amen? So in other words, we have got to, in Christ, go from being above the Word and being letting the Word being judged by us and flip it in Christ and let the Word be above us and then let the Word judge us. And then whatever we find out that needs to be changed, guess what? <laughs> Change it. Change it. I guarantee you whatever God shows us that we need to change, if we will take the opportunity to actually be a disciple and actually to be disciplined, we'll be better people for it. And not only will we notice in our life, but people outside of us will notice us. Amen? I remember so many people said, well, I remember when that guy started all over the road. He wouldn't provide for his family. But he's a changed man today. He goes to work every day. He loves his wife. He loves his children. What's happened to him? And the answer is, Jesus got a hold of his life. And he changed him. Amen? Every one of you can look back in your history and you should and rejoice. What did God change you from? And what did He change you to? Amen? Amen. And the reason I say that is because that's how we beat the devil. Amen? If you can remember that when you came to Christ and you said, Lord, forgive me. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you arose for my justification. I believe it's a finished product and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Guess what? The moment you set that faith in motion, God accepts it because you've said it according to the Word of God. Then what happens? Because God accepts it, God puts it in the sea of forgetfulness. As far from you as the east is to the west, the Scripture says. To be remembered against you no more. Praise God. Amen? So what does it mean? What does it mean if suddenly those sins that I put under the blood come back to haunt me? It means the devil's on your trail. That's what it means. Because it's Satan that's the accuser of the brethren. Amen? God will never condemn you over your past sins. Amen? When you have them under the blood, when you confess them to Jesus Christ, when you surrender them at the altar of the Lord God, they are gone. The power of Jesus' blood cleanses you. Amen? Amen? The Word of God gives you faith to believe that. So when it seems like a voice saying, do you really think God forgave you that? The answer is yes. doesn't matter what it is. Yes. And I guarantee you, if you in the face of the enemy will say, in the name of Jesus, I gave it to God and I'm not taking that sin back. Yes, you can't condemn it. And guess what? You won't walk around depressed or feeling beat down. You'll walk around in victory and joy and peace. And that's where God wants you to be. Amen? God doesn't want us to walk around like beat down people. Amen? He wants us to walk around like champions because we are. Jesus is our champion. We serve a great almighty God. Amen? Amen. Who is able to do all things and there is nothing impossible with Him. Amen. If there's a mountain in your life, the Bible says speak to the mountain and do it in faith and the mountain will be removed. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. But you've got to believe it. And it doesn't mean anything if the mountain seems like it's growing. Amen? That's flesh. You've got to see it the other way. God sees it from above. And in God's power, He says, snapping my fingers and the mountain's gone. Amen? He wants you to be victorious. Amen? Now, if God wants you to be victorious, guess what? We need to want to be victorious. Here's the truth. In Romans chapter 8, Paul describes the life of freedom from the slavery of the flesh and the liberty 
by being led by the Spirit. Amen. You see, we're not binding ourselves as a slave to more drudgery. When we come into Jesus Christ and we get yoked with Him, we get bound with Him. Amen. Guess what? We're free. <laughs> Let freedom reign. Amen. Let freedom reign. Let freedom reign. Amen. Amen. I, my prayer for you and has been all week and my prayer for myself is, Lord, let freedom reign in my life. Amen. Amen. And help me to share others to let freedom reign in their life so they can walk around excited and happy mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. Preacher, you ever going to get to the rest of the sermon? Well, I wrote this so I can do it in one, one lesson, two lessons, three lessons. You know, I'm not going by getting through it quick. I want you to get some. Have you ever sat down at a meal that looked like somebody just filled so much with love and you saw every bit of it? Now, you didn't want to swallow it down like we do sometimes. You wanted to enjoy that particular good steak. You want to chew it and enjoy the taste. You want the smell. And you take a long time to eat that meal. Amen? Guess what? You don't have any digestion if you do that as much. But it's like Jesus. There's so much in this holy word. It's the best thing. It's better than steak. Amen? Amen. It's something that you can chew on and chew on and bring into your heart and it will change your life. It will change your family's life. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm off the introduction into the body of the servant. The first point. We let freedom reign in that Christ Jesus has set us free from the struggle with the flesh in order that we might serve Him in victory. That's why we're set free. Jesus wants us to serve Him in victory. In the previous verses in chapter 7, Paul speaks of his struggle in his flesh. He says, the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I do. Amen? But the things I want to do, those things I don't do. In other words, Paul wanted to do good. His desire was to do good because he said he desired the Lord. He delighted in the Word. But his Adamic flesh got in the way. And sometimes he failed. I'm struggling, he said. Do you understand where Paul's coming from? If you're a child of God, you know what I'm talking about. There are times your flesh just whoops you up. Amen? But you want your spirit to be above that. And so when we begin to see that, when we begin to see that our victory is in Christ Jesus, He tells us, I was struggling because of the law. The law had demands. But I'm under grace. Is the law evil? No, we'll find out in a minute. He didn't think the law was evil. What was the purpose of the law? To reveal sin in me. And when I began to understand the law, I found out I was really sinful when in God's standard and I was compared to His holiness. Mm -hmm. Amen? Right. You see, when we compare ourselves to God, we're going to cry out like Isaiah is. Woe is me. I'm a man of uncleanness. Mm -hmm. Among a nation. He knew after he seen the Holy God, Christ, Holy God, Holy, Holy, Holy. When he saw him, he knew. And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent a coal of, off, a coal of fire from the altar of God and put it on his lips. Amen? And then when he had taken care of those evil things in him, and that fire on the lips was like sanctification, he could hear clearly when God said, Whom shall I send and who will go with me? Go for me. And Isaiah's by Hear my Lord. Amen. 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 You see, the easy thing about God is this. If you're really in tune with Him, and if you're really walking like you need to walk, and if you're really walking in the Spirit, when God says, I want you to go do this, you don't argue. You just do it. But when you're walking in the flesh, then it, well, is that truly you, God? 
I don't know God. I had a precious lady tell me one time. Said, I'll do anything God wants me to. As long as it's in my home county. I'll go anywhere he wants me to. As long as it's in my home county. No, don't work. Now he's not going to call everybody to be missionaries. He's not going to call everybody to move out of their county to another county. Or from one city to another. He's not going to do that. But are you willing? If he did. Amen. God's not saying I'm going to make you do it. He's just saying I'm just wanting a, a willing vessel. Who will be obedient and do it. So we do that. Why? Because we want to be free from the struggle in this flesh. We want to live a victorious life. We want to live a life that we can push back our shoulders, jut out our jaw, and say, I'm a child of God. Amen. I'm a child of God. Paul tells these people who are struggling with this the importance of the law. He says it's to reveal sin, the sin of man. But here's the thing. He says it's ineffective and powerless to help me. The law can't help me. That's why Jesus had to come. If the law could make a man righteous, if a man could become righteous by the law, Jesus would not have died. That's right. Amen? Mm -hmm. The law would have saved mankind. But it couldn't happen. And the Father knew it. And so God sent forth His Son clothed in sinful flesh among us. That He might show us how to be victorious over sin, how to beat the struggle in the flesh, and to walk according to the will of the Father. Do you remember what Jesus said? The words I speak, they're the Father. I've come to do the Father's will. The works I do are the Father's. He didn't take credit for any of them. I came. How did He teach us to pray? How did He teach us to pray? Our Father. And what's the closing thing to that prayer? The kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's the clincher. That's the clincher. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen? That's how we have to pray. Father, not my will. Now, I want to tell you, when we pray, Father, not my will, but thy will be done, we can be more accepting of some things that happen in our life. Mm -hmm. We can be more accepting and not blame God. Doesn't do any good to blame God anyway. Just drives you away from it. Amen? Accept where you are right now in God. Believe that God's fixing to take you to a better place. Amen? And believe that He's going to give you the Word to do it. He's going to let the Spirit of God help you do it. And when you get through that valley to the other side, He's going to change you and transform you. To a better person. Amen? Amen? You see, God always has a better idea. Amen? He always does. So, Paul confessed that the law is holy, the commandments holy and just and good, and he concludes that the law brought man to the knowledge that he was exceedingly sinful when compared to the righteousness and holiness of God. Paul confessed that the law was spiritual, but he was carnal, like all mankind sold under and become a slave to sin. He says we're slaves. We're slaves because of the Adamic nature. The old sinful nature. That's what keeps us slaves. Amen? But when we put on the new man Jesus Christ and we accept His nature as the nature we're supposed to have, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He tells of his desire to do good, but he's unable to do it. And things he does not want to do, he ends up doing those things. This brings him to a realization. It brings him to an illumination. It brings him into an insight that he delights in God's Word, but there's a law in his members which brought him into the captivity of the sin. Have you ever thought about that law in your memory? That that's what keeps you held to the flesh? Because you are born under sin, and a lot of times because of the way that you're raised, 
your flesh goes after those things. The blood of Jesus and the Word of God will break the power of sin. Amen? This is Paul's struggle. It's our struggle. Be free from the power of sin and the dominion of flesh that we might live in freedom in Christ Jesus. Let freedom reign. Amen. He suddenly has that revelation that for the reason of his freedom from sin and his release from the dominion of his flesh, Christ died and rose again. And Christ was his freedom. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Christ is a victory. Do you understand that phrase, body of death? You see, back in Roman times, if somebody was guilty of murder, one of the ways that they judged them was they took the dead man. Bible scholars have studied this stuff out. They're a lot smarter than me. And they would tie the dead body foot to foot Hand to hand and nose to nose with the murderer. And then they'd send the man out into the wilderness. And when the body began to putrefy and rot, it would kill the man who killed the man. Horrible way to die. But you got to remember the Romans had no sanctity of life. They had no... You say, well, why didn't he get a Christian marriage, a burial? Because he wasn't a Christian. And the Romans weren't Christians. Amen? you got to realize, if, if the Romans will take a man and nail him to a cross, they're very low in morality. They're very real, low ethically if they'll take a man. That Pilate said, this is a just man. If you can crucify a just man, you're pretty low on the totem pole. So what are we saying to these things? We're saying simply this. And I'll do two and three next week. That struggle that you go through at some time, like Paul said, is a struggle every man, woman, boy, and girl goes through. It's not unusual. It's just part of being born a sinner. Some folks don't like that, but Jesus said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why did He get into that? So He could say, whosoever will come unto Me. Amen? Amen. Jesus, listen, Jesus said all lives matter. I'm dying for everybody. Amen. I'm dying for the baby. I'm dying for the adolescent. I'm buying, dying for the teenager. I'm buying for dying for the young man, the old man, the young woman, the old woman. I'm dying for the ones who's right in their mind and the ones who aren't right in their mind. I'm dying for everybody. Amen? God's grace is sufficient for everybody. Now, as I come to a close, as we pray this morning, I want us to pray. God, you realize while the preacher was preaching, I, I admit I'm having a struggle. There's some things in my flesh I'm struggling on. I'm not perfect, Lord. That's the first thing you have to do is admit you're not perfect because nobody is. But Lord, I want to be like you. And whatever I need to change to be like you, reveal it to me by your word. Confirm it by your Spirit that I might know what you want me to be. And then, Lord, everything that I see, and you can shout when you want to, it looks like uh, Carrie's driving up, uh, or at least her car's here. So it could be she's fixing to get wet. Uh, but we'll see.